Chapter 13 Ghosts Averland Plains, 411 miles from Altdorf The dawn brought little comfort for the Grimblades, despite the rising sun. It had yet to warm the plains, or their aching bones. Breath still ghosted the air. It came out in white gusts, as Carlick had coughed and wheezed. They'd slept sitting up, and there was nothing to pack, though Lankman had leaned over onto Eber's shoulder and was profoundly embarrassed when he woke. Didn't even buy him a drink. Rex had chortled with uncommon good humor. He'd obviously slept off the booze at last. Brandt had stayed awake all night. Volker, who'd been the first up, would later say how he rose to find the cold eyes of the man regarding him through the twilight mist. Volker didn't stay to chat. In minutes he was gone, scouting off into the distance with Dog. Few words were exchanged when the others stirred and began to move. No one felt like talking after a harrowing night. It was a while trudging through the long grasses before the grim silence was lifted. "'Who would want to kill the prince?' asked Eber, unaware of the sour mood and more out of exasperation than any desire to actually know. "'I can't understand it.' "'All political figures have enemies, Brutan,' Lankman replied. "'Wilhelm is no different. It could be one of a hundred or more men.' It's poor timing, muttered Keller, his displeasure at the mission currently outweighing his other concerns. So there's a good time to try and kill the Prince of Altdorf? asked Karlik. He looked towards the sun, gauging its position, and therefore the time. By his reckoning, they had maybe three hours before the Prince could arrive at the valley. The pace suddenly didn't feel fast enough. Hurry it up, he said, eyes front, hoping to see Volker. The huntsman was still ranging ahead with his mutt, keeping them away from any greenskins that might be roaming ahead, and leading them to the hills. His last report had been some time ago. When his back is turned and his guard is down said Brandt to the sergeant's first comment. Carlick scowled at the dry humor, finding it inappropriate. "'I wish Verweiter was here,' said Lankman to Carlick's right. "'We could use his wisdom now.' "'Aye, he might have been canny enough for us to get out of this shit heap we currently find ourselves in,' said Rex, his humor fleeting." Masbrecht looked affronted. Saving a prince is an honor, brother. It is Sigmar's work we go to do this day. Rex was livid. He calls me brother one more time, and it won't be Wilhelm's assassin we'll be stopping. Shut up, Rex, snapped Karlik. Whatever it is between the two of you, deal with it. This is the most important deed you'll ever do in your entire life. Don't wreck it. He warned, before turning his anger on Masbrecht. And you, save your sermons. You know he doesn't like it. Not all of us are willing converts. He wanted to say more, but saw Volker running back towards them. Just beyond the next rise, he said. The land slopes downward and lifts again to a set of hills. That must be the place. You sure? asked Karlik. As I can be. The map was quite well detailed, and there are few hills in Averland, especially so close to the road. Makes you wonder why the prince came this way at all, said Lankman. A valley is a good place for an ambush. The road is the most direct route, I suppose, said Karlik. But who's to say the prince even chose it? None of it really mattered. The morning sun was high, and its rays were creeping steadily across the plains, 
time was running out. Cresting the rise, the grim blades had the sloping plain laid out below them. A short distance, and the flat land rose up again, the road bending with it, and there were the hills. Strewn with rocks, hollows, and wild bracken, it was a rugged place full of shadows. Lots of places to hide, observed Volker. They came at the hills from an oblique angle, ever watchful for movement, keeping the sun behind them all the way. He'll be up high, added Brand, probably with a bow or harquebus. He'll want to kill the prince from a distance, so he doesn't have to fight the Griffin Corps. So we're looking for a marksman, then, said Karlik. Perhaps we'll be able to stop him after all. A marksman, yes, said Brand, and a swordsman, and a knife-wielder, and a pugilist. Assassins are killers. They're trained well in the art. Don't make the mistake of thinking just because he wants to shoot the prince that he can't execute him, or us, in ten more ways. Yet again, Karlik felt a cold shiver, but couldn't deny the sense in what Brand was saying. He decided to change tack. He could be anywhere, behind any rock, hunkered down in any hollow, hidden in the long grasses, or crouched upon any ridge, as still as the earth, said Karlik. We root him out before the prince gets here. He cannot know of it. To do so would mean this whole dirty business gets out, and, alive or dead, the prince and his cohorts can't ignore it. You heard, Ladner. The empire would fracture under the strain. We'd have civil war. Karlik eyed his men, and felt a surge of pride, even for Keller, who he considered a bastard of the highest order. We are not assassins or spies. We are just men, soldiers of the Empire, who face a difficult duty. This is an enemy like any other. Find this whore son, stop him, and stay alive into the bargain. He allowed a short pause to think, how in Sigmar's name did we ever get here? and then deferred to Volker, who knew the ways of hunting better than any of them. We split into pairs, four groups, one compass direction each. Start wide and move in slowly. Stay low and keep your eyes open. Chances are he's already in there, waiting. Sobering thought, muttered Rex. Just as well, where you're concerned, said Karlik, before addressing his men. No heroics, he said, looking at Brand in particular. Find him, signal your comrades, and we'll silence this cur together, without our blood being spilled to do it. Faith in Sigmar, he added. The Grimblades echoed him, all except for Rax. And more be damned, said Karlik to himself, trudging down towards the road, where the hills loomed with quiet menace. Eight against one. So, why did it feel like they were the prey? Up close the hills were vast, easily sprawling a half-mile, either side and along the road. They dipped, rose and undulated, as if in a pact with the assassin to frustrate the Grimblade's search. Patches of scree and loose rocks made the ground treacherous. There were small ravines and caves. Crags and sheltered gullies were everywhere. Each and every nook had to be searched. Other creatures might lurk along the hillsides. It wasn't unknown for trolls, or even larger beasts, to make their lairs in such places. Keller, for one, hoped that wouldn't be the case. Maintaining his concentration was hard, what with the other looking on and dogging his every step. Leave me be, he hissed. A side glance revealed his plea had gone unheeded. Plague me no more, he said louder, prompting an angry look from Volker, who he was paired with. Even Dog looked annoyed, but then that little bastard always did. Keller allowed himself a smirk, the first for some time. 
Volker loved that mud more than he did his own family. Back in Mansgard, he'd seen the beast lick the huntsman's feet. Volker slept in his boots. He was not one to take them off regularly. Keller assumed the affection between mutt and man was probably mutual. The sliver of his old self passed, like a flash of sun on metal, and the other reasserted its presence again. Still no sign of the assassin. The two men carried on. Lankman stumbled and cursed through his teeth. He jarred his ankle. It was painful as he fell down at it, but he could still move well enough. The sun was high now, and he had to squint when he looked up. Morning was nearly done. Brand was leaving him behind, hurrying through the hills like a wolf-hunting deer, or maybe another wolf. There was something of the bloodhound in the man. So driven to find the assassin was he. Lankman noticed he'd left his pistol unloaded. Brand wanted to face his adversary up close, push steel into his flesh. So the assassin knew who had killed him, who was his better. It was as if need compelled him. Lankman had seen Brand in battle before. The man was frightening, but this was different. This was a whole other side of him. And as he struggled to catch Brand, so intent on his prey, so utterly possessed with scarcely restrained violence, Lankman thought this was the truest side of the man. Brand had been a mystery until then. Now Lankman saw him for what he really was, and it scared him more than the wyvern. A green ocean stretched before them, and the hills were its waves, and the rocks its shore. Here they trolled for a single fish, one with hollow eyes, black and lifeless as a doll's. Karlik felt those eyes upon him. Ever since entering the hills, he had not been able to shake the feeling of being watched. Paranoia was becoming an unwelcome bedfellow for the sergeant. The sun was rising, and though it warmed his face, it also sent the shadows fleeing into the deeper crevices of the land, filling them with darkness. Karlik began to imagine enemies lurking there, a masked assassin, wraith-like and undefeatable. Van Hans, the witch-hunter, armed with murderer's noose and the traitor's brand. Karlik gasped when he felt Rex's hand on his arm. Sergeant, you all right? He found his composure quickly, hiding his surprise behind annoyance. Fine. Never mind me, Rex. Keep your eyes on the hills. He is here. I can feel it. They forged off together in silence. Karlik was annoyed at himself for allowing his mind to wander. If the assassin had been watching then, he would have loosed an arrow or shot in the sergeant's back, and ended him then and there. Idiot! He didn't mean to take out his anger on Rex, either. At least the drummer was sober and alert. It was more than could be said for him. Rex needed watching closely. If nothing else, he needed keeping apart from Masbrecht. He'd developed a passive loathing for the man, taking umbrage at his piety. Karlik had no desire to see that become anything more than angry words. Honestly, he wasn't sure what Rex was capable of. He knew something of the man's past. He'd spoken of it once, after their first battle together. Rex wasn't a drummer back then, and Karlik only a sergeant. The Reichland border was under attack by beastmen out of the Reichwald. It had been a tough fight, and many good men had not seen the sunrise. Perhaps being faced with mortality, so close and immediate it could be felt as a shiver in his bones, Rex had decided to talk of his troubles. It had just been the two of them, huddled over mugs of strong spirits in a booth in some tavern, the name of which Karlik could no longer remember. Through slurred whispers, Rex had told of the day a mutant was discovered in their village. A boy back then, he'd been fishing in a stream nearby his village when a girl had cried out. A sullen child, who kept to himself, was being bullied by the edge of the stream. 
he scuffled with his attackers, a blacksmith's son, his head full of soot, and a farrier's lad, who had been hit on the head with too many horseshoes. There was low cunning in these boys, who pulled at the sullen child's clothes, intent on first stripping him, then dumping him naked into the stream. They succeeded in removing his boots and leggings when the girl, skimming stones on the bank, had noticed something terrible. The sullen child had fleshy webs between his toes, and a small tail of bone protruded from the base of his spine. Cries of, Mutant! Unclean! echoed across the stream and down to the village. Men with hooks and staves came running with the local priest in tow. The sullen boy was crying, tugging on his leggings, and reaching for his boots, when the village man seized him at the priest's orders. So disturbed was he by what he'd seen, the old cleric sent messengers to the nearest town, and a chapter house of the Order of Sigmar there. Everything changed when the witch-hunters arrived. Their leader was a brutal man on a crusade that was anything but righteous. Rex never saw the sullen boy again, but he knew what happened to him. The purging didn't end there. In a fit of pious rage, the witch-hunter declared the entire village spoiled by chaos. He found signs of taint where there were none, and condemned innocents to the pyre and noose. When some of the villagers resisted, it only inflamed him further. Rex's mother could see to the end of what was happening. She took her own son away from the village square, where a mob was baying for blood, little realizing that soon their own flesh would crisp on the pyre. For the witch-hunters brought men with them, hard men who served the order in a grim, unspoken role. At the points of their swords, they herded the villagers one by one into the flames. Only the priest was spared, baying for blood and retribution, transformed by fear into a madman. From his hiding place under the floorboards of his house, Rex could hear their screams. He covered his ears against the terrible noise and screwed his eyes shut. By the time he opened them again, the village was quiet. Smoke and the smell of cooked meat lingered on the air. The stench aroused no hunger in him. He retched and fetched up an empty stomach in the street. Rex emerged to find the village gone just a burned-out skeleton of wood and scorched stone. Piles of ash and charred bones were all that remained of his kith and kin. Though he searched on his knees, tears streaking his soot-stained face, he never found his mother among the remains. A part of him hoped she had escaped, but knew deep down that his fingers might have brushed the ash of what she had become in the pyre's flame. Desolated and alone, Rex had wandered down the road leading from his village, wishing for death. Against the odds, he reached Grunberg and lived on the streets until he was old enough to take a piece of silver and join the Emperor's armies. Even as a boy, Rex had been a survivor. It was no different when he became a soldier, but he bore the mark of that day in the village deeper than any physical scar. He never trusted priests again, and hated witch-hunters with a passion. In the end, he and Karlik had an accord. Karlik had listened to the tale quietly, and consoled him at the end. It was like taking the stone for all the emotion Rex had shown him. Neither man could have known that Karlik would meet that self-same witch-hunter many years later, and that the zealot would not live to torture another innocent. The man was gone but his legacy remained, and like a shadow creeping over the face of a setting sun, it was getting closer to Karlik. A flash of light caught Karlik's attention. Something glinted in the morning sun. Metal? He followed a second flash southeast, and what he saw turned his blood cold. Prince Wilhelm and his knights were on the road and heading towards them. Still several miles distant, there could be no mistaking the Griffin Corps banner, and the troop of armored men on horseback. Karlik surveyed the hills quickly out of instinct, as if the murderer would present himself now the moment drew near, but he saw nothing. 
just rocks and rugged earth, patches of gorse and bracken, a hundred places where the shadows could hide Wilhelm's would-be slayer. The flash of light came again. Soon it would be a flash of black powder, and the prince's blood would be solid on the ground. Eber squinted and scowled. He rubbed at his eyes as he was momentarily blinded by something shining into them. Shielding the sun of her head with one meaty hand, he tried to blink away the afterflare, but it came again. He tried to follow its origin. Too late he saw the mirror being used to blind him. Too late he realized the blurry shadow figure was coming for him. Eber heard Masbrecht cry out a warning. The burly Reichlander wasn't fast enough as he brought his short sword up to guard. Fat pig, you're so slow, said his father's voice, echoing in his head from beyond the grave. Then he felt a knife enter his body. The first few stabs were hot and sharp, but the ones that followed grew cold and numb. Even Eber, with all his strength, couldn't stop the blood flowing from his body. As when his father used to beat him, his arms fell to his sides, his head went down to his boots, and he could do nothing.